Welcome. I'm Kate Fulb. I'm director of Hollywood Health and Society, which is a program of the USC Annenberg Norman Lear Center. And tonight we're thrilled to partner with the Writers Guild, both East and West, and First Responders First, which is an initiative from the CAA Foundation, Thrive Global, and the Harvard School of Public Health. We also have additional partner support from CAA's Full Story Initiative and the All In for Healthcare campaign. This is gonna be an amazing discussion. Um, but first, in case you don't know about Hollywood Health and Society, we are all about storytelling. We like stories, as I'm sure you do too. They're entertaining, but we also can learn from them. And stories can and have actually changed the world which is why it's important that when we tell stories, particularly about health and science and safety, that they be as accurate as possible. Because when it comes to health, people take what you present in your stories as the truth, believe it or not. Powerful stories have been known to spur people to get tested for HIV, to ask their doctor for a cancer screening, to become an organ donor, and to seek help for a substance use disorder, and much more. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about how stories can support the mental health of healthcare providers in particular. Quick commercial. Hollywood Health and Society is a free resource to the entertainment industry on all topics around health and safety and security. And if you're interested in writing about breast cancer, addiction, maternal health, reproductive health, and many other health and safety topics, we can connect you to the appropriate and proper vetted information and experts to help ensure that your storylines are as accurate as possible. And we understand Hollywood's timelines and your challenges, and we're ready to help. We're ready to help take some of the burden off of, of researching through Dr. Google uh, for your storyline, we can help you with that instead. Um, so give us a shout at hollywoodhealthandsociety.org. We're happy to help. As I said, we're ready on demand to help you out. Okay, so now we're gonna be putting the bios of our panelists in the chat so we can get right to the discussion. And although everyone here is a professional, um, an amazing professional, we've opted to call everyone by their first name. We're also gonna be taking questions from the audience in the last 20 minutes or so, but you're welcome to add your questions through the Q&A function at any time when they occur to you. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Okay, so tonight our moderator is, we're very lucky to have him, uh, CNN's senior White House correspondent, who has an illustrious bio as well, as well as three children. And am I allowed to say one on the way? Um, whoops, I said it anyway. Um, so you can check the chat for his bio, but please welcome Phil Mattingly. Hey, Kate. Kate, thanks so much. Um, we have now, I think you guys are very aware of the bios, please read them. They are all significantly more distinguished than mine, but they are also the reason why I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity tonight uh, to be able to have this conversation, a conversation that I think a lot of us are certainly aware of. It's been more acute and I think more covered over the course of the last uh, year, two years now. Um, I feel like time has lost all meaning in the last two years. Um, but a systemic crisis, I think, for healthcare workers that existed pre-COVID is now been exacerbated to a degree that I don't think uh, most people can get their heads around. And I think it's a it's a such an important subject matter. Um, but it's not just the the numbers and what they mean; it's the people themselves and what they've been through. And so I want to bring on the panel now: um, Corey, Emily, Natalie. David, uh, we're all gonna kind of walk through the things the healthcare professionals have seen, the statistics and, and very specific issues that uh, Corey and his foundation have been working through. Um, and some of the things that David, as uh, somebody who's in the business and is obviously has a very successful show in the business, um, which I would note in talking to some of my buddies who are healthcare workers, they said, oh, no, no, New Amsterdam is one of the good ones. So I'm not going to talk about the ones they didn't think were good, but I thought that was a positive thing. 
Um, but more than anything else, I want this to be a good conversation. So as Kate said, please uh, drop your questions in as soon as possible. We'll try and get to as many of them as we can. Um, I have a very long list of questions right here. Don't make me ask all of them. We'd like the audience to participate. Um, so with that uh, already too lengthy introduction, Corey, I kind of I want, I want to start with you and we can get into the specifics of the foundation um, in a little bit. But one of the things that I, I was struck by uh, as I delved a little bit deeper into this, I think we've all covered this on the news side of things over the course of the last couple of years, but in, in kind of getting ready for this, um, I was wary of making the correlation between uh, friends and, and colleagues who have PTSD coming back from war zones and healthcare workers, because you're always, you know, a little bit, uh, you don't necessarily want to take that step. And then the more I talked to people and the more I read about it, I realized that it is, it is closer to apples to apples than anybody could imagine. And I, I was just wondering if you could kind of give your sense of things, what you've seen um, to, that underscores that point, it, just in the numbers and the research and the studying that you've done. Sure. Um, and, you know, thanks again for having me uh, this evening. Really want to thank everyone for paying, paying this close attention to this really key issue. Before the pandemic, I think it's really important for the audience to recognize that the healthcare workforce suffered from you know, suicide rates, particularly doctors and nurses, twice the national average. So going into the pandemic, there was already high degrees of depression and suicide among the healthcare workforce. But what we have now, from a particularly a mental health perspective, is really a crisis that has not been experienced before. And you know, I was recently looking at some data that came out of Medscape, which, it, which surveyed almost 20,000 physicians. And 88% of them, 88% of them reported some type of depression. Now, the vast majority wasn't probably clinical depression, but that is not a safe place for anybody to be. That's not a pl safe place for, for doctors or nurses to be practicing. And it's certainly not a safe place for patients to be. Um, and when you ask the physicians, you know, does the, and the nurses, does this kind of thing impact your ability to take care of yourself, your ability to take care of patients? Resoundingly, the answer is yes, at some level. What is so incredibly challenging, though, and you alluded to war, and I want to bring that analogy in really quickly, is that for the medical community, doctors, and in 22 states, nurses, getting help is actually getting mental health help actually can compromise your career. And let me drill into that just very briefly. We have learned over the past two years that there are at least six barriers to mental health access. We wrote about them in US News and World Report on September 9th, so I won't go through all of them. But many of them are about your license, about your ability to work in a hospital, the ability to get insurance, if you're, you know, you got to get malpractice insurance, the ability to get paid, those kind of things all present the medical community. Um, and they don't impact you and me. You and I can go and we can get, we can go to a therapist or we can take an antidepressant or just take care of ourselves without fear of losing our job. But unfortunately, now we have 88% of the doctors self reporting some type of depression. And more than half of those will not get help because of fear for some kind of reporting. And that is the, the, uh, the tsunami that we all are looking for, looking at right now that's staring us down. It will impact our future workforce, our current workforce, our current patients. So, and, and I guess, you know, and we'll get into my sister-in-law's story at some point here, but that was one of the things that she clearly articulated to us before she died by suicide, which is the stigma around and the barriers to getting mental health treatment. So we've got, we've got a big challenge ahead of us uh, as a healthcare community and really as a society to take care of those who've been taking care of us for so long. Yeah, the combination of stigma and barriers, I think was the, it, it was eye opening and I wasn't aware of it. You know, Emily, um, I first learned about you last summer in the Washington Post, which made very clear that I should never go hiking with you. Um, based on how it was written, if you read the story, it was in July, it was, uh, it was it was good in that sense, but that was probably the one moment of levity. And I think of a very um, almost gut-wrenching story in terms of your experience and what you dealt with um, in Southwestern Virginia and to, to the 
extent you can, can you walk through kind of what the day to day was like for you and is like for you in a time of COVID, uh, do, just trying to do your job? Yeah, I think a lot of the misinformation and everything has been incredibly challenging. Um, when, you know, interestingly, when that article first came out, I felt a little bit torn about it because, um, first of all, you know, I have uh, contacts uh, all over the country and I know misinformation is not unique to my area by any means whatsoever. Um, and some of that COVID denial and everything, but um, it, it, it seems like as the pandemic has gone on, it's actually become more prevalent, um, which I was surprised by. I kind of thought as things went on, you know, everyone would eventually kind of know someone who had COVID or, you know, things would kind of level out. And um, it seems like it's honestly progressed, like it's gotten worse with um, some of the misinformation and everything and that makes it incredibly challenging. Um, you know, we're, um, when the pandemic first started, it was, so scary. Like, um, I tell the story a lot that my husband is the one that first said to me, like, Hey, there's this virus. And I think you, you know, we should be concerned about it. And I was like, you're insane. Like I work in healthcare. If there was anything to be concerned about, we would be preparing, but, um, you know, on our pre-call Natalie said this, and I've said this a hundred times, like, it seems like a lot of things with the pandemic was very reactionary and not proactive. And um, that has been key, but it's just like, you, you had all that anxiety, you had, you know, hearing stories about uh, lack of PPE and all of that. And then on top of it, just dealing with a lot of the misinformation. And it's just so, that is a huge stressor because you're trying to care for patients. You're trying to figure out this crazy virus that we've never seen, you know, anything like this before. We're, not totally sure how to treat it, especially initially. It, it doesn't act like viruses we've seen a lot in the past. Um, and then on top of it, you know, people denying COVID exists and arguing about masks. And, um, and now, you know, later on in the pandemic, what we're seeing now a lot of is um, families threatening physicians because they don't want to use ivermectin, um, you know, and different things like that. Or, you know, just the other day we had families, you know, asking about, well, what are you going to put on my family member's death certificate? Because we've heard that you make more money if you say they died of COVID. But the patient was admitted for COVID and was on the ventilator for COVID and was dying from COVID, you know, so totally not making that stuff up. And it's just super challenging when the community thinks you're manipulating and lying about things and you have that stressor on top of the, you know, just seeing families lose people constantly and losing patients constantly. And um, particularly the first year of the pandemic being terrified for your coworkers and your own friends and family. Um, and, you know, wanting to be able to feel like you can protect your, yourself and your community. Yeah, and it, you know, that brings me to Natalie, which I think, you know, it, Obviously, you were in uh, the documentary, The First Wave. It's it's on Hulu now. It obviously, it's gotten a lot of critical acclaim, but it was just uh, uh, it, it was almost mind blowing the the access that the filmmakers had to see it every single day. Which gets to Emily's point of the just the fear, and I think we forget about it now, two years in, about you know people who are coming home or weren't sleeping at their houses because they didn't they were afraid for their families or were showering and washing their clothes before they could come in the house, um, and two years in, it seems like a lot of people have forgotten kind of that initial fear, which is only built for you guys now that you're dealing with the politicization of things as well, which what, what, you said that something, Natalie, first off, I would say letting a camera into your home in the most stressful time of your life early in the morning as you're getting ready for work is heroic in and of itself. I don't know how you could ever allow anybody <laughs> to, to do that that early in the morning uh, anyway. Uh, but you said something in a, in a subsequent interview that really kind of stuck out to me, particularly given the topic uh, tonight, which is um, you, were, you were talking about kind of the spirit and the what's the necessity for somebody in healthcare in terms of dealing with patients, working with patients. And you said that spirit has been taking hits continuously, collectively trying to figure out uh, how to rejuvenate ourselves and feel our essence again, which it, it was kind of beautifully worded in a tragic manner. Um, and I was wondering if you could kind of 
elaborate on that a little bit in terms of this moment in time as somebody in your position, as a physician, um, trying to find almost not just what made the job enjoyable, but what made you good at your job on a day-to-day -day basis and the struggle there. You're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good. Okay, so even before the pandemic, being a physician, particularly, I worked at a major city. So there's always been that volume issue where technically there wasn't enough providers to the patient ratio. So that's something that's always existed. But with the pandemic, that ramped up tremendously and quickly. And what was beneficial in the beginning was that the unknown was actually something that was familiar to everyone meaning how we weren't fighting this misinformation in the beginning. We were trying all efforts, both from the administrative side, the um, healthcare workers on the medical floors and in the emergency rooms. We were trying everything and anything just to help as many patients as possible. And particularly in New York, that fear actually made people actually, okay, let's sit still. We're not gonna do anything that could make this even worse because what the rest of the world didn't see at the time were the particular mass graves that were being built. They didn't see that we had literally had no room whatsoever for patients. Lobbies were being used to hold patients. Um, every single room was now double occupancy recovery rooms for surgery that was used for patients. So, but all of that in the beginning, while we still had this fervor, this energy to kind of do whatever we can to combat this virus that no one ever imagined, that helped us, especially in the beginning, to power through. We were on autopilot. We had to compartmentalize the sheer terror we were seeing with people just dying at a blink of an eye. I would literally speak to patients. And then next thing I know, there's a code blue rapid response. These patients are clinging for their lives or they expired. While in the next room, I can have a patient who fortunately was doing okay, yet complaining about the food. So, but yet I still have to maintain my composure. I still have to prioritize what's most beneficial for my patients as well as my colleagues because the staffing is an issue and it's always been an issue. Um, when you add on trying to look for PPE where in the beginning there was definitely not enough. And then when we did have the mask was one end of the hallway, the gown was on another room. We're running around trying to help patients who needed our help, but we're busy trying to protect ourselves. So we fast forward and like what Emily is saying, what she said is that that misinformation and as well as the countless hours that we have put in because of the lack of staffing that people have been picking up extra shifts just to combat all the, the volume that we continue to have. That is like, I have two enemies. Not only am I facing this invisible virus that is wreaking havoc on, on so many people that I can't even, some people I thought would do horrible and they did fine. And some people I thought who would make it didn't. I had to face that enemy. And then I have to have the same sense deal with this misinformation. And a lot of times it's causing even more harm. And when the end result is not what the patient wants, even though their family members or the patient may have exacerbated the overall situation and their care, like the, inadequate care that they've received, I am the one still at fault. I am the one that's still getting all of the complaints. I am the one hearing from administration, well, why is this patient not, why am I getting calls of this complaint? Or I'm hearing from the family members and all of these issues where there, the science is out there. There are facts about how we can best treat and prevent. That is something I think Unfortunately, 
we have always been on the reactionary side. And that is why we're always too late. A lot of times that's why things that could have been prevented that it hasn't. But at the end of the day, the same healthcare heroes that we were cla we were getting claps, we were getting all these free food, all that stuff. Now we're the enemy. Oh, you can't trust them. We're the ones that are benefiting. We're getting more money, which is the, I wish people can see, I wish people could see my checks so they can see like, that is absolutely not the case. Um, and it's disheartening because we're giving our all. And sometimes you, you question like, why should I save someone who doesn't want to be saved at, to some degree? If there isn't accountability on the flip side of patients and their family, family members, what do you want us healthcare workers left to do? So, and mentally that takes a toll because at the end of the day, we're all human. And I, I, wouldn't, work, I wouldn't wish this type of suffering on anyone, both my colleagues, as well as my patients and dealing with death consistently like we've had. Um, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. It's, uh, I, it's confounding and, and still wild that healthcare workers who were always the most trusted, right? You were the people that we would go to and no matter what the politics or what moment was happening in the country, for some reason that, that you guys have been drawn into this and I, I don't have an answer to it. Um, I've spent a lot of the last couple of years trying to figure it out and failed miserably. And, and I think to some degree, David, that's where I kind of wanted to transition over to you because writing about this moment, putting together a show on this moment is extraordinarily complex, right? This is such a politicized issue. Uh, it's how and why again is is beyond me but trying to do it's not beyond me uh, no well, yeah no, I, guess. I think it's, it's, it's no, but, but that kind of <laughs> that gets to the point though to some degree of uh we all understand what the realities are how do you approach trying to write or trying to put together a show uh in this moment given the dynamics that are at play that still tries to address some of these issues and yet is also something that people want to watch I, I don't know how you thread that needle you do but i don't know how you do it sometimes um i mean just listening to these stories fills me with such blazing anger at the people who have access to vaccines and don't get them and come into the hospital and put people, put people on this panel, basically threatening their life, threatening their livelihood, and taking time away from patients who did get vaccinated and are in the hospital for something else, but aren't getting the time and attention they need because you're dealing with people who are unvaccinated and had access to the vaccine, but chose not to take it and are now in the hospital, taking time away from people who did take the vaccine and need care. I'm filled with a blazing hatred and anger. And that's what I bring into the room every morning. After reading the paper, after listening to our medical advisors, what they go through on a daily basis. And I'm just, I'm, I'm like burning hot, like I am right now listening to these stories. And our writers are also filled with other, luckily, um, some are filled with as much rage as I am. Others are more empathetic um, to the plight of those who have been mistreated by the medical community, have a history of abuse and neglect. Um, from those in the medical profession and, uh, and allow me to see other sides um, of an issue that just fills me with hatred and rage. Our show is not a hateful and rageful show. We are an optimistic show um, and we try to show what healthcare should be rather than what it is. Um, so we thread the needle by talking about bringing up these issues, 
and then trying to show the different sides of them. When we tackled vaccine hesitancy, um, I think last season, we went out into these marginalized communities and asked why, why were you not getting the vaccine? And they talked of, you know, Tuskegee and they talked of, you know, your hospital tried to sue me last month and now you want me to come in and get vaccinated. Like, <laughs> and we did this huge montage of why people didn't get vaccinated. And the end of the montage was, but I still got the shot, but I still got the shot. You tried to sue me, but I still got vaccinated. Tuskegee happened, I still got vaccinated. And we showed all these marginal communities who we thought were unvaccinated, were vaccinated. And the people who weren't vaccinated were 30% of the nurses at a uh, elder care facility. So anytime we try to criticize others, we turn the mirror back on ourselves. Why aren't people in the medical profession getting vaccinated? Uh, why are people with medical, degree, medical degrees spreading misinformation? Uh, so my blazing rage and hatred uh, gets uh, filtered through a lens of compassion and empathy and, and, and turning the mirror on ourselves. And when I say ourselves, I mean the medical profession, not writers. Um, and we, to us, the medical, you guys are our heroes, nurses, doctors, administrators. We are, you are the reason we write this show. Uh, you are the reason that, that takes my, that makes me so angry. And, and, and tries to turn that into art or something that is informative and entertaining and truthful and honors all the work that you've done for us over the last two years. Um, so that's why, uh, you know, sometimes we're successful at threading the needle, other times we're not, but um, you guys are the reason why we write the show and we're, we're so grateful for all the work you're doing on our behalf. Corey, can I ask, you know, I first learned about your sister-in-law, I think in the New York Times, there's a, a every single graph was a, a, just a gut punch, one gut punch after the other. It was beautifully written and very well reported, at least from my perspective. You, obviously, um, everybody has a different view when, when they're reported on, uh, I, I know quite well as a reporter. Um, but I think what why I was so taken aback in reading it is, you know, there were none of the signs, there, there were none of the warning signs, there were none of the, the traditional things uh, that I think people think of when they think of somebody who, who dies by suicide. Um, can you kind of walk us through uh, what transpired and kind of what led you to, to where you guys are today? Uh, absolutely, Phil, and I, I appreciate you picking, picking up on the timeline and, and the lack of any, you know, prior mental health challenges because for us that was that was a huge part of the story um so i'm going to take you back um to march 10th 2020 um i was on my annual ski trip with lorna uh, dr lorna breen my sister-in-law she was a 49 year old emergency medicine physician in manhattan um every year she wanted to get my kids um uh, my kids more and more immersed into the, her sport her favorite thing uh, someone who didn't have children, she really adopted my two children as uh, those who were, she was going to pass the torch in terms of skiing. So uh, my wife and I are pretty poor skiers, but Lorna was great. So we were in um, Big Sky, Montana, March 10th. Now that was the week, it was the first week that really the president of the United States went on television. That was the same week. He said, um, we have a problem, you know, so just to orient folks to the timeline. So about two days after that, Lorna was back in the emergency room in Manhattan, um, where she was the medical director of a very busy emergency department at the New York Presbyterian Allen Hospital. And she quickly contracted COVID within 48 hours and got very sick, uh, not sick enough to be hospitalized, but very sick. And she spent about a week trying to recover at home high fever, loss, losing tons of weight, just sleeping a lot. When, during her waking hours, she was trying 
to help manage by phone the emergency room, the staff were calling out sick, all the things that Natali was talking about, the, un, the lack of clarity around PPE, all of that was happening, all of that chaos. So because Lorna was a pro and so dedicated to her patients and to her colleagues, the soon as she didn't have a fever, she called back and said, put me on the schedule. That was April 1st, 2020. So she contracts COVID a few days after, you know, March 10th, and she's out, and now she's back at work. She's completely depleted of her resources. The only thing she doesn't have is a fever. And she's scheduled for 10, 12-hour shifts in a row. And on April 1st, she called us and she said, everyone can tell I cannot keep up. This is going to hurt and or potentially ruin my career if someone recognizes that I can't keep up. So that's April 1. She also very importantly described the scene that that Natalie was descri was describing to us earlier as Armageddon. Patients dying in the waiting rooms, running out of oxygen on portable vent, portable oxygen just their, that in their lap. Um, not enough beds, not enough staff, not enough PP, all of those things converging. And she's completely depleted of resources, not well. And her concern isn't for herself. Her concern is someone might think that I can't take, take this, so I've got to keep going. I'm really worried about my career. So only eight days later, on April 9th, we get a call from Lorna that we never would have expected, which was, I can't get out of my chair. So my wife, Jennifer, says to her, well, get, get to the airport because we're in Virginia and get to the airport. She says, you don't understand. I can't get out of my chair. Jennifer says, get on, get on a train, get on a train, come to Virginia, come home. She says, you don't understand. I can't get out of my chair. So we call a friend of hers who's a doctor in Connecticut. Her friend drops her patient load and rushes in to take care of Lorna, throws a bunch of stuff in her bag, drives south towards Virginia, all the while picking up, you know, handing her off to another friend on the side of the road in Philadelphia. All the while, Jennifer is screaming as fast as she can up the road on, on I-95, trying to intercept them. And she finds Lorna on the side of 395 outside of Baltimore in just really, really tough shape. And so, because I worked at the University of Virginia Health System at the time, she turned around and she drove her right to the emergency room on April 9th. And then she was admitted the first time and only time in her entire life she, she got mental health treatment ever. She was in the inpatient unit. And within about 24 hours of that, she called us and said, my career's over now. I'm going to lose my license to practice medicine. And we're and both Jennifer and I are attorneys. So we're like, that's, that's not a thing. You don't need to worry about it. And she's like, no, no, no. You need to understand. I'm going to lose my license. I'm going to lose my job. I can't have gotten medical, mental health treatment. And uh, Lorna, was in, Lorna was in the uh, inpatient psychiatric unit for just over a week. Um, we thought she was doing a lot better. Uh, she came home um, to be with her mother and then uh, was staying with us for a little bit of time. Um, and on April 26, she died by suicide. And the shock that that had on all of us because of that timeline, Phil, that you were talking about, because she didn't have any prior mental health conditions. She had never, she was in tip top shape. She, we were having a conversation on the side of the ski slopes like we're talking today, highly functioning. But what had happened to her by contracting COVID and then this culture in medicine and this regulatory environment that they're put in just crushed her. It crushed her soul. And so we found ourselves 12 hours after she died on the front page of a New York newspaper over the family's objection, never wanting this story to be told ever under any circumstances. But it was out. And there really wasn't anything we could do about it once it was out. And what we heard in response to that initial feedback though, was even more unimaginable, which is we heard from hundreds 
of medical professionals, doctors, nurses, who reached out to us, who said, you don't understand how bad it is. I've put prolonged self-care for so long. I've taken sabbaticals and made up the fact that I was on a fellowship because I had a mental breakdown. I've had to, I was, I was pregnant and I was, uh, I was pregnant and, you know, rounding on patients as a resident and had to bring a solo cup with me and, and get, get sick in the solo cup in the hallway and throw the cup away and throw some gum in and just keep going. These are the stories we heard. And so in June of 2020, just about a month and a half after she died, we created the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation, looking out for the well being of the healthcare workforce because it was clear that somebody needed to step into this arena and say, I see you, I hear you, and I am here to help you. And so that's our story. Um, it is Lorna is our light and she is our inspiration, but we are doing this work for the rest of the healthcare community because someone has to stand up because what, ex what Lorna experienced is wrong, it's unacceptable, and it is not something that in this current age, any, any person, let alone a medical professional, should have to fear for um, just to take care of themselves. So that's our story. And, and I should note that along with the amazing work that the foundation does, you've also had a major effect already on public policy. You know, elements of uh, uh, legislation named after your sister-in-law were in the American Rescue Plan. I know there's still a bill, I think the House passed it in December as well, um, that's significant. A, a Senator I know well, Tim Kaine from Virginia is behind it and if he has his way and he generally does, <laughs> it'll, it'll get through the United States Senate as well. But that, it, it kind of, when I was going through the provisions of that bill, I was struck by this idea of Wait, this isn't the this isn't the norm. Like these are these are provisions uh, that are expansive, and yet felt like I sh I assumed that they these types of things were yeah. in place to some degree. And well, so so a couple things. First of all, this is first of its kind legislation ever. There's never been federal legislation that has ever looked out for the well being of the healthcare workforce. So talk about feeling honored and humbled to be named after Lorna. I mean, it's, and you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. But as you say, Phil, I mean, really it's 2022 and we have to have legislation that says we have to take care of the well-being of the workforce. I mean, it, it's, it should be, it, it should have been that way forever, but it's not been that way. The one thing I will say is the Americans with Disabilities Act has been out there for a long time. And a lot of what we are observing, and again, as I said, Jennifer and I are attorneys, so we're dogmatic when it comes to this stuff. There's a lot of violations of the ADA out there. So, so one could say that the ADA protects, however, clearly not, because it is, it is widely known. And in fact, in that same survey I was talking about before, the number one thing that doctors said they were not, the reason they were not gonna get mental health treatment right now, 47%, said, we're not going to get mental health treatment because of fear of reporting. 38% uh, said fear of, you know, 47% fear of reporting to medical licensing boards, 38% fear of reporting to insurance. So, uh, and then followed, followed by, you know, fear of stigma professionally. So we have a long way to go here. The bill did, a, it passed the Senate unanimously earlier in the summer and is about to be passed again. Um, and we are hoping actually for a signing ceremony in the White House. So uh, I might see you there, Phil, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, I, I can get some hair tips, I'm hoping. Yeah. From you. <laughs> I think you're good. I, I, feel, okay. I feel good about where you are currently. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, but that, that actually leads into what I wanted to ask both Natalia and Emily about, which is the idea of leadership in hospitals, leadership in uh, health systems at this point in time. And again, I, 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 I'm sorry, I keep drawing it back to it, but I'm, I'm just more familiar with it from work in terms of, you know, when things started to shift at least a little bit in the military, it was when leaders stepped up at the very top and said, this is something we have to address. We have to address the stigma, but also have to address reporting and making sure that there's no repercussions for people that need help. You know, what are you guys seeing both, and I don't want you to like, dime out your own workplaces necessarily, but, but what are you guys seeing 
when you talk to colleagues, when you talk to, to friends uh, as they try and confront some of these issues? So I can go first because I have um, two separate experiences. Um, because in October of 2021, I decided to quit my full-time job as a hospitalist or a physician who works on the medical floors. Um, during the height of COVID and for the past three and a half years, I worked on a schedule of seven days straight. I worked seven days straight and then I'm off for seven days. So in the beginning, I'm like, yeah, that sounds great, like seven days, but people don't understand for those seven days, I'm working 10 hours, 16 hours a day consistently. And during the pandemic, that time, the seven days off, those days didn't feel off at all. Meaning when I was working the seven days on, I couldn't do laundry. I didn't find anything to eat. I didn't have time. I was literally waking up, going to work, coming home, trying to get as much sleep as possible, which was minimal. So it takes a toll. And I'd had my fair share of mental breakdowns on the floors, on the floors. Like in the first wave, you just see this one time rant where I'm just, I couldn't hold it in anymore. Where you just see people just suffering. We didn't have like the bare minimum for some of these patients. And this was happening more consistently. And I remember one time, and it's not, it's, it's, I did have a leadership, the chief of my department during one of my mental breakdowns, they did sat me, they sat, they sat me down in the office and they tried to like, just let it all out. But even in my head, even during my rant, my mental state, I was clearly not at my best at handling patients. The first thing I'm thinking of, but I have 18 more patients to, to, to take care of. People don't understand when you're watching the TV shows, you're seeing the patients with the doctors, just one patient, where at the height of COVID, I'm seeing 25 patients, all of varying severities that I have to cross manage. So where I can have the most horrific experience in one room, I now have to pretend as if it didn't happen in the span of like five minutes, because I have another patient who's asking for my assistance. So, Fast forward that the hallways, walking down the hallways literally gave me flashbacks where I felt I couldn't stay and work at that facility, even though my colleagues were amazing. But I feel in terms of leadership and the culture of medicine to take a sick day to call out, especially from a physician standpoint, it feels taboo or it feels that, well, you already know we're short staffed. Why are you taking off? Because if I take off, my colleagues now who already are swarmed, they now have to pick up the shifts. Because in the beginning, we weren't getting additional help. In the beginning, we didn't have like outpatient providers coming in until it was a reactionary thing where they saw that we were like floundering. That's when we started having more travel nurses, travel physicians, and as, as many support as we, we could. But that culture of, oh, you're sick, are you sure? Like you could have the flu, but as long as you didn't test positive for the flu, like people wouldn't even get tested because that means you can't go to work, but they would have you go through to work no matter what. And that's just the culture. It's not for any one particular facility. But I do wanna say long, this is a long story, but I quit in October, 2021, but then I decided to pick up an assignment to work as a hospitalist in Montana. I thought it's October, 2021, we're a, we're, we're a year out of the pandemic. I've seen the worst of it in New York City. I'm going into, I want open air. I get off the airplane, I see mountains, no one's wearing masks. I'm like, oh, COVID didn't get them? I'm like, maybe because they don't have so many people, right? Wrong. The public had this whole perception that COVID didn't exist. Masks are not a thing. People were, getting, were not getting vaccinated, but in the hospital where there's only one, one hospital for the whole town, which is different from what you see with cities where there's all these hospitals back to back. When a patient gets sick in rural America, 
Now, patients weren't looking like myself. They weren't of minority. They were mainly Caucasian patients who have low socioeconomic status. But within those hospital walls, they were inundated with COVID. We had no place to transfer patients to get additional care because the state of Washington was full. Idaho was full. Like we were trying to get services from telemedicine from Utah. And what patients don't understand is that resources aren't the same throughout all of the US. So what, what, what people were seeing in the major cities was also happening in rural America, but you don't have every single specialist at your disposal. You don't have all these different facilities to transfer patients to get the most optimal care that I would want to give them. So that ment mental state was another catastrophe in my book. Cause I, I was now put in a place where I wish I could have done so much more with, but they had no meds that I would use, typically prescribe. And then, but this leadership was different where I had a full out mental breakdown where I thought, this is it. They're gonna admit me to the psychiatric ward today. Like, cause the patient, how the patient passed away. I don't wanna go into details for like HIPAA purposes but the whole medical team was crying, bawling. I ran out of the hospital screaming, knees crying, knees on the floor screaming. Like, why did I come here? What is this? Like, but I was surrounded by people I have never met. I was only there for four days before my mental breakdown. And the chief medical officer of the hospital spoke to me. I had colleagues come huddle around me and hug me. They forced me to take the day off. I was actually gonna like suck it up and literally go to work still and finish seeing my patients because unfortunately, a lot of us, that's our mentality in healthcare. Like there are people worse off than me. So who am I to try to take care of me where I'm, it's really nothing compared to what some of these patients are going through in the hospital. But this leadership literally said, nope, you're not coming in tomorrow. They had a pet therapy dog. Like, I kid you not, like a pet therapy dog come talk to me to help express some of my feel like feelings. And they even, this was above and beyond, maybe because I was in a small town, I don't know, but like arranged for me to have like a peaceful day off. And just seeing that juxtaposition from going to a medical facility where there's so many providers and how sometimes you can be lost like this little fish in a whole sea. Whereas in this facility, because there's but so many of us, we have to take care of what we have because we don't know who's coming to help us out. Because the care, the, the call for help that came from New York City, that came from the major cities, if you go to a town that's so small, no one's coming. No one even knows that town exists. And that's what's happening across America that people don't understand. That the way COVID is hitting in these smaller towns, you're not going to get the call for help and that the National Guard, all that other stuff that some of these major cities are getting. So that's what I want patients and family members to understand too, that the more you can help yourself, the better. Yeah. Natalia, when you speak, I feel like a bobblehead because I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's no, I mean, it's just, I really relate with everything you're saying. And, um, you know, uh, just, um, I, I think that, um, what I really relate with what you said about feeling like we're fighting two wars because of, fighting this virus and trying to learn about how this virus works and what we can do to treat it and everything. And then fighting the misinformation and, you know, um, it's devastating at this point in the pandemic, seeing uh, patients die uh, from an illness that's almost preventable as far as severe illness, you know, it's just, it's devastating seeing that and enraging as well. You know, it's, you're, you're constantly struggling with these, all these different emotions where you have frustration and anger as well as empathy and 
you know, understanding that there's a whole bunch of different reasons for why people have believed the things they've believed and acted the way they've acted. Um, and as far as um, leadership goes, um, that's been a absolute defining thing uh, for my experience in the pandemic as a nurse. I can tell you um, with certainty that I probably wouldn't be working as a nurse right now if it weren't for um, our nurse managers and the leadership at my hospital. Um, our nurse managers from the very get-go have come out on the floor to help, taken patients, come in on their days off. They've constantly checked in with us, you know, how are you guys doing? What do you need? Um, they've tried to be very communicative because things are constantly changing and, uh, you know, trying to let us know what's going on, what the plan is from, you know, the top administration in the healthcare system that we don't necessarily, you know, always get to hear from. It's a big healthcare system. So, but they're communicating with us and letting us know what's going on. And, um, I have lots of friends and lots of other healthcare systems, and I know that's not the case across the board at all. Um, and it, I think that leadership is just so huge in um, healthcare in general moving forward. And you know that transparency and um, communication and support. We knew that our nurse managers had our back. They were gonna be there with us and for us. They weren't asking us to do anything that they weren't gonna do themselves. Um, and that was just absolutely huge. I mean, and like I said, I have lots of friends and everything that um, uh, work in different healthcare systems that didn't have anything like that. Um, it was just, you know, take as many patients as you have to take. Sorry, there's patients in the hallway. I'll be in my office or at my house or whatever. And then uh, from a mental health standpoint, um, Corey, thank you so much for your work and, you know, Senator Kane and everything. Um, our hospital was really um, good right away with um, promoting the EAP program. I mean, there's emails, screensavers on the computers, posters all over the hospital about, you know, um, how to call and, and get counseling. They encourage you to do it. There's, um, there shouldn't at this point in our hospital at least be fear of, any kind of repercussions for anything like that. But I think um, going back to you know, the leadership, that allowed us to work together as a team and to have that great team dynamic because it wasn't this every person for themselves mentality. It's, um, you know, we all work together and have this camaraderie. And especially when you're fighting all these different fronts because you're dealing with this virus and you're dealing with seeing this devastation that this virus is causing. And then you're dealing with misinformation. And like Natalie said too, you know, you're doing everything you can to help patients and families. And then sometimes you are getting blamed because, you know, you didn't use ivermectin or you didn't, you know, whatever. Um, um, or, you know, being accused of just outright being a liar um, or doing it for some kind of personal gain. And um, I, I did make more money during the pandemic because I was working 60 hours a week, you know, and didn't want to be, you know, I wanted to be home with my family. Um, so um, leadership, like you said, Phil, is, is huge. And I think that's a super important thing to look at. And, um, I think we need to look at our systems too, our healthcare systems. I think healthcare workers feel really abandoned by a lot of the agencies that were supposed to be caring for us, you know, and protecting us and making sure we had the resources we needed to do our jobs. Um, and, you know, even with the messaging, like how political and stuff, everything with the virus became, it made our jobs so much harder um, because of you know, some of those systems that were not doing a good job with the public health communication. Um, and um, I think I do get frustrated with individuals who refuse to get vaccinated and buy into a lot of conspiracy theories and things like that. But I know like NPR did a story and they talked about like the number one reason that people changed their mind with vaccine hesitancy was having a good, com honest, transparent conversation with their healthcare providers. And healthcare providers have to have the time and resources to be able to have those conversations with people. Um, you know, and, and I just think that that speaks to some breakdowns in the system um, at large, but um, I feel super, super lucky, you know, to have the support that I've had during the, during all of this craziness, because I just don't know 
that I could have walked out of this with my mental health intact at all, you know, and um, yeah, we're all struggling. We're all having anxiety and nightmares and all kinds of things, but, you know, um, having that support has been tremendous. And there's that myth that there's a nursing shortage in our country. And the fact is there is not a nursing shortage. It is a failure of leadership to adequately staff those nurses and have a decent patient nurse ratio. And, and somehow this myth of a nursing shortage is what everyone is talking about and why there's not a decent ratio. And it's just bullshit. It's a failure of leadership because it's all a capitalist. It's... So I'm going to chime in. So Please, I, thank I, you, because I'm my gonna, rage is just, I can't even speak. Yeah, because I'm glad because like, I don't even have, I don't think the mental capacity to hold all the rage. So I'm glad I can share it with you because the business of medicine is yes. what's not transparent. Yes. So let me tell you why. Another reason why I quit is because this pandemic has amplified and put a real magnifying glass on what leadership puts value on. They're not investing in the people. They are investing in monetary, the numbers. Because mm -hmm. what I've been seeing is that, because there are travel nurses and there are travel doctors that are, we are called like locum tenens. Okay. So we're independently contracted. We don't we're not tied down to any particular hospital. The pay difference between a traveling nurse and a traveling doctor compared to a full-time employee who is doing not like the same work, if not more, it's astronomical sometimes, yeah. okay? What they would offer these for additional, um, for like the travel and the locum uh, yeah. position. And the issue is, is that they rather keep sucking out the full-time employees to the most of the, like as much as they can, meaning take this extra shift, take this extra shift. You can just, can you work this extra shift? Like sometimes last minute, they'll tell you, you, you get a phone call. Whereas there's a whole, another workforce of independent nurses and doctors that they can easily contact but they don't want to necessarily put the money up. And unfortunately that right there is a mental, like, cause even with New York city, that Omicron, the Omicron surge that we went through was horrific. The numbers were not this, were the same, if not more than the initial pandemic in terms of the volume of patients. Yeah. Yet the amount of additional staffing was not necessarily there. We're doing, even, a story, yeah. We're doing a storyline now where basically a, a, a nurse is waiting for their patient to be discharged. They can take them to another facility. And basically our behavior, our, our mental health uh, chair, uh, our chair of mental health um, basically has to have an intervention because he, he sees the nurse clearly having a panic attack um, and reliving these flashbacks of, of COVID and, Basically, the whole episode leads to our therapist saying to this nurse who is dedicated to this profession, who found this calling to be a nurse, and his answer at the end of this episode-long therapy session is, you need to quit. You need to quit because you love this profession, but this profession does not love you back. You are giving everything you have to this and you are not getting anything in return. And yes, the way, yes, the, when you help a patient, it fills you with fulfillment and satisfaction, but no one is helping you. And we are so pro public health. We are so pro doctors and nurses as, as heroes that for our show to say, you need to quit the profession, you know, something, something went wrong. David, can I ask you? Oh, oh. I, I was just going to say, yeah, David, you, we've seen a huge walkout. I mean, we've seen that walkout happen in spades. And, and I, again, again, to the business of medicine and Natalia, you're on fire lady. I'm, I'm, I'm wishing I was with you and uh, I'm, I'm just glad I'm on this panel with you, not on the other side of you, but the, uh, I, I'll tell you, you know, it's also a little mass in the numbers. So 
if you ask what the turnover is in any hospital, they'll give you the average over, a, <clears throat> over thousands of nurses, but in the departments where it matters, the ICUs, the emergency departments, what's your turnover there? Oh, it's, it's 50%. So, you know, it's, it, there's also some of this masking, but David, they're all walking out and they're not coming back. I mean, ironically, you know, one of the authors of our legislation, um, her sister was a nurse in the pandemic. And while her sister's writing the legislation, she quit being a nurse in a major metro area. I mean, it's like, it was, you know, and, and there's stories about that all over the place right now. Yeah, Sorry, absolutely. Bill. But I do want to say something else. Like, <clears throat> granted, like, a lot of us want to quit. A lot of us. And we've always contemplated that. But back to the business, granted, we haven't had to pay student loans for, thank you, for like years, like for a couple of years now. But a lot of us can't quit. I like a lot of us in terms of the debt, especially from a physician standpoint, Absolutely. what other change in career can I go to make the same amount of money to pay off this mansion I don't own because of the student loans? So that's another mental component that stresses a lot of people because I'm first generation physician. This is new territory. My parents, they were born and raised in Haiti. They came like, fortunately, like my dad, like he came up the ranks and stuff like that. But that type of debt is something you can't just ignore either. So a lot of people stay in medicine because we don't know what are the other options out there. And that's another mental toe. Mm -hmm. David, can I ask, it's something I've been fascinated by. We also have a question from somebody in the audience as well. Um, we've been talking about kind of the, the healthcare profession, I want to shine the light a little bit on yours to some degree, which is in terms of storytelling, COVID has kind of disappeared. Um, and I'm not specifically talking about New Amsterdam, but I'm saying generally, like you look on TV, you look at any, any show on any network at any point, it's as if the last two years didn't happen and Omicron certainly never <laughs> occurred. And I guess m my question is, why, number one, and two, how do you navigate, I think a moment where people are tired of it, exhausted, we see it in our ratings when we report on COVID. So is that a part of the calculation too? That's a great question. Um, we did an entire season of COVID. Um, our doctors wore masks during their scenes. Um, we, we was just COVID, 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 COVID. Um, Cause we were portraying, we were loosely, based on Bellevue. Um, and I mean, like we're blatantly based on Bellevue. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to, be, um, to, be, uh, to, to be a public hospital in New York, we just felt we had an, we had an obligation to be about this at this point in time. Um, so we did an entire season that was all COVID. Um, and, you know, our ratings went down by a huge amount. We, dropped a lot of, and also we got political. We started talking about uh, racism in healthcare. We started talking about all these things that were happening in the country along with COVID. We started talking about why global warming is a health crisis, why poverty and racism are health issues. Because you have to remember when COVID happened, look, Trump was in office. I couldn't leave the house because California was on fire. Uh, the air was so bad you couldn't breathe outside because of the wildfires. George Floyd was murdered in May of 2020. Like, it wasn't just COVID. It was the entire country was like on fire. And so that was our season three. People didn't want to watch that. And it was very obvious. Hmm. Um, I didn't care um, because I have an obligation to uh, the doctors and nurses who are our medical advisors by day and work at Bellevue at night and vice versa. Um, so our show is for them. But in season four, I was like, I can't ask the actors to perform with these giant masks on. Like you're taking away all the drama. You're taking away an actor's tool. Um, so we decided to start season four as if we were coming out of 
Delta. People were returning back to the hospital after working remotely and we just embraced this. We are gonna be post this Delta variant. And it worked for a couple months and then Omicron hit. Even though our, all of season three was saying, please get vaccinated so other variants don't come along. Um, we obviously couldn't predict the speed of this new variant. And it, again, it happened in a matter of weeks. We're writing scripts months ahead of time. So we were, when Omicron hit, we were so unprepared to deal with it realistically on our time frame of let's write about it now by the time we film it and by the time it airs will be six months later and who knows if that variant will still be here who knows what the country will look like so our show has come what's interesting season three is airing now in spain and in latin america all our doctors are in masks everyone's burned out and it looks like we're responding to the Omicron variant. And we're like, we're like right on the money in terms of, um, in terms of being at the zeitgeist. But that was, if you watched season three a month ago, you, it would say like, wow, this is like out of date practically. So there's no way for Hollywood to address the nuances and intricacies and speed uh, and unknowableness of this virus. So that's just one. And the other one is our actors need to be out of masks. And so that puts you in a kind of endemic part of this pandemic that we haven't reached yet, but is necessary so you can see actors' faces. Mm -hmm. So it's like a two pronged. The idea of, and it was interesting, uh, full disclosure, I'm often driving home from work uh, when you guys air, uh, so I, I don't get to watch every single week, uh, but I, I, it was a fun part of the research for this that I just got to crash and binge on your show, um, <laughs> which was better than a lot of the prep that I have to do for my day job. Um, but you've dealt with burnout, I think, from the very beginning to some degree. It's been a kind of a constant element in the show, but in terms of telling stories about what Natalie, what Emily, what Corey have reflected just over the course of the last hour. Um, one, do you feel like those land? And, and, I, and I ask it in the same sense that I was asking about COVID, where is this something that's difficult to do in a network television show because you're afraid that people are gonna turn away or they don't wanna hear about it? And two, given the fact you've addressed it multiple times over the course of the seasons, what do you feel like has been the best method of storytelling that allows it to resonate with fans and audiences? I'm a bad judge of what resonates with our audience. Um, all I can do is know what resonates with me, you know, cause I mean, all I have is Twitter to find out what the audience thinks, unfortunately. Um, it's a bad gauge. It's a bad, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and really they just care if Max and Sharp are gonna like hook up or not. Um, but for me, we're doing a story now about violence against healthcare workers. Mm. Um, deliberate violence against our frontline workers who are doing nothing but trying to help us and save us. So that's our next story. Because again, like you said, we. There was burnout before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, uh, the 12 Patients, the book that New Amsterdam is based on is the memoir of, the, of um, Eric Mannheimer, the former medical director of Bellevue. And from day one, he's saying, you have to do more stories about physician suicide, about doctors and nurses. He, he walked in on one of, uh, walked in the room, walk, walked in the office of one of his most trusted and beloved surgeons and found him dead on the floor with a hypodermic needle in his arm. This has been going on for so long, um, way before COVID yeah. that it's, and you know, he thinks we don't, we don't talk about it enough. And we're like, we can't do another story about physician burnout like it, but it's, it's, it's so big. 
And so we're now we're transitioning to the other horrible topics that are affecting our, our frontline workers, unfortunately. Look, we'd, think, love, we'd, love to be a, we'd love to be a show about Max and Sharp hooking up, but until the world looks different, we have an obligation to, to be more than that. Sorry, Emily. No, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just Thanks. really resonate with that. And it's been said over and over again, Natalia, you've said it tonight, Corey, I've heard you say it before. COVID is, did not create brand new issues. It simply put a magnifying glass, poured gasoline on whatever, these issues that were already there in the business of healthcare, nurses, physicians, respiratory therapists, what have you, get into healthcare almost across the board, right? Because we, we want to help people and impact their lives. And when you get into a system that will not allow you to do that and continues to put more and more pressure to see more patients faster, to take on more load, to not be able to care for, you know, your mental health, let alone your patient's mental health, that's where the burnout comes in, you know? Um, and, and I think that's super important and needs to be highlighted. I feel like we're at a critical critical moment in healthcare right now and in, in the history of, you know, in the future of healthcare, because we have an opportunity right now to go, whoa, how do we prevent this from happening again? How do we address these issues? And if we don't address this now, if we go back to normal life as, you know, COVID becomes endemic and stuff and we don't address, I mean, what's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen to our healthcare system that was already, you know, on some shaky ground in a lot of systems? Um, there's an excellent book called The Price We Pay by a Johns Hopkins physician talking about some of these very issues with, um, you know, the business of medicine and um, those kind of issues that need to be addressed. And that whole mental health piece ties so much into that. So, so Emily, along those lines, I kind of want to ask each of you, as you look into the future, be it an endemic phase or a post-COVID phase, however you want to put it, um, Emily, I think you, you framed it perfectly, right? Like this exacerbated and laid bare fragilities that have long existed more than anything else. So what are, the, what are the solutions here? When you look out into the future, if you could change one thing, each of you, or, and I'm sure the list is lengthy, but, but, but what would it be? What, what's the thing that you think would have the, the most significant impact? Corey, I'd start with you. Uh, I was hoping to go last, but sure. Um, that was gonna, it was gonna be this great, it was, it was gonna be amazing, by the way. Now you're just gonna get mediocre. Um, now, you know, Healthcare is so focused on the, the patient, it has forgotten the workforce that takes care of the patient. My hope is that we remember that in order to do the best patient, you know, in order to get the best patient outcomes, we just have to take care of the workforce. So um, that'd be my, that would be my hope. We, we, have, we have published just in the last 48 hours with a consortium of, of uh, experts um, this 2022 healthcare workforce rescue package uh, sounds like a piece of legislation, um, but it is, you know, five very simple things that every hospital in this country can do. Uh, we actually put it on our all in wellbeing first for healthcare uh, website, but, but really the overarching cultural statement that I think needs to happen here is we have to take care of those who take care of us. I'll go. Uh, I'll go. I think I want people to see that Healthcare doesn't start at the hospital or the clinics. Healthcare starts at the home. A lot of us physicians, I'm only getting a snapshot of a person in whatever minutes that I have to take care of them. I'm trying to get a whole story of what brought them to this current space. Most of the time, it didn't happen overnight. This is something that has been brewing for a while and there are a multitude of factors that contributed to you now seeing me. I don't have superpowers, no matter how much people wanna think that healthcare workers have. So I think in terms of the health, the healthcare force, cause a lot of us are, I don't know, ignorance right word, but a lot of us don't even live in the communities that we work. So we don't even know what exactly the patients may be going through from a day in day out standpoint. So I really want people to held, hold accountable in terms of patients in their own well-being, being more cognizant of what it means to feel sick or ill or just not balanced 
And then the same applies to healthcare workers, accountability for when we have to say we're, we need help ourselves because then we can cause harm to patients because we're human too. We can break the same way, but when we break on the job, there are a lot of lives at stake. So I just want people to kind of get that, stint, that sense. Emily? Um, yeah, it's definitely hard to nail down on one thing, but I think um, a huge thing in healthcare is this kind of fee for service mentality where um, a lot of systems are looking at their bottom line. Now, good healthcare costs money and physicians and nurses and all respiratory therapists should be paid well for what they do. That's there's, I'm not questioning any of that at all. Um, but when, you know, physicians are being pressured to see patients faster and faster, you know, in outpatient settings every 10 or 15 minutes, because we need to ramp up, you know, um, how many patients we're seeing and you can't, you just can't address some of the issues that you're seeing or, you know, putting an emphasis on procedures rather than on some other interventions that might really help patients. I mean, I hate to say this, but I, I feel like, you know, part of all this misinformation, there are people in the public that have lost trust in the healthcare system because of things they've experienced. Um, and I think having that connection with us because we are able to create that connection because we're able to care for ourselves because we work in an environment that fosters that kind of thing uh, goes a long way in the health of our society and making our insanely expensive healthcare system have the outcomes that it should be having for the kind of money we're spending in healthcare. Um, yeah. David. Um, so I'm not as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always looking at it from the outside, but so from my limited perspective, um, in 1763, Bellevue in New York was founded, America's first public hospital. So before the constitution of the United States was signed, our founding fathers thought it more important to have a public hospital that treated people free of charge. Like that was before the constitution. Healthcare is a human right. And I firmly believe in socialized medicine as a, as a, way, to, as a way to give people the human right of healthcare. It's not gonna fix everything. It's not gonna happen for a very long time, if ever, but it's a way to take the corporate, corporatization of healthcare off the table and make it a human right for those who deserve it. When you started within 1763, I was like, man, we got like 10 minutes left. This is gonna be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, oh, yeah. I could just sing Hamilton all night. <laughs> yeah, no, right. <laughs> Um, all right, so we, I wanted to get to two uh, questions from the audience, and then I've got one closing question. We'll see if we can, can squeeze this in uh, in, the, in the time that we have. Um, the first one that I wanted to go to is for David. It says, I'm a former respiratory therapist of 20 years who writes for a show about first responders. I find that I'm always at odds with what's accurate and what serves the story. David, how do you navigate that? I often wind up just feeling like a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, you know, when you watch a met, when you watch a legal show, the client comes to the lawyer, presents a problem, and then they're in court. You know, in five minutes. Um, you just have to condense. We we condense time um, for storytelling, um, and it. I hope no one is watching our medical show for medical accuracy. Um, please call your physician, call 911. Um, we are presenting stories in a very condensed time frame um, to get an emotional and an intellectual response out of you. Um, that is our, that's our goal. Um, we do try to be as accurate as humanly possible with the information we're giving you. Um, and I think that's very important so not to contribute to any misinformation that's already out there, but just know that our, our time frame is incredibly condensed um, so we can take you on a patient's entire journey in 43 minutes. 
and then the next one I wanted to get to uh, for Corey, Natalie, and uh, Emily is what can people like us, normal everyday people who care about mental health issues, do to support our own community of healthcare workers? Emily, I'll start with you. Ooh. Um, <laughs> did you want to start? Go first. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> so nowadays, um, hospitals are scored, meaning in terms of patients get a survey, how was your experience? And at the end of the day, written information that can be referred to in the later on is crucial. So simply inquiring, how have you protected the mental health of the cohort of the healthcare workers? Make the hospitals yeah. accountable because these hospitals are now putting patients first. What you say trumps a lot of, unfortunately, what healthcare providers can offer or can say. So I think if more patients and their loved ones speak up in terms of, well, when I went to the hospital or the clinic, my, my physician or nurse seemed flustered. She was running around. She had all these, how, how can you fix that? I think that's one way to kind of help out. Yeah, definitely. And I was going to say too, you know, getting involved with like the Learner Brain Foundation in any way you can, whether that's a donation or, you know, calling your Senator and that kind of thing to support um, any kind of measures that are going to promote better health care and better support, um, like Natalia was saying, in situations like that, hearing feedback from patients and the public is really key. And having support outside of the healthcare system for measures like the Lorna Brain Foundation um, are pushing for is super important and super helpful. Emily, thank you for saying that. Wow, that was amazing. I would, I'm glad this is being recorded. Um, I, I think um, I want to combine what the two just said. Uh, I've heard from many people who know people who sit on hospital boards, know people who work in hospitals, who are now asking the question, how are you taking care of the workforce? And how are you reporting that? How are you reporting it to your boards of directors? How are you reporting it to your members of Congress when they come visit? How are you talking about this? I think the more we can create an echo chamber of people who are asking the doctors and nurses, how are you taking care of yourself? And then those who are responsible for their well-being, uh, how are you met, you know, how are you contributing to that? I think those that would be huge. And and I will say, and, I, and Emily, thank you for, for talking about our foundation. We've we have we have stepped into this arena and we are here to help. So if anyone wants to, you know, learn more about how they can help. Uh, DrLornerBreen.org is our website, and we're all over social media. Um, I'm pleased that uh, Natalia has recently joined our board of directors, so look out. Uh, <laughs> we're we're going to make even bigger splash than we have before. Um, and, and then the last thing I would just, I'm going to say one more thing. Watch the first wave. If first wave will give you a window into what this workforce has been through, yes. bring your tissues. Yeah and bring your thank you cards because that is a 90 minute journey into, into just what, what this workforce has been through for two years. Yeah. Yeah. Man, if, if Natalia is going to be on the Hill lobbying, God bless the senators. I oh, feel yeah. I'm Get ready. very, very Get nervous ready. for them. Hey, yeah. we got like one minute left just to, to wrap things up. Um, I want you all to put David on the spot and tell him specifically, but more importantly, tell the audience you're watching, what would you guys want to see more in a sentence or two uh, on TV as it pertains to your profession, what you guys focus on on a day-to-day -day basis? Take for a minute. Wait, for me personally, I want to see a hospitalist, like meaning, Every doctor tends to be a surgeon or a doctor that actually does some type of procedure where it's an immediate gratification kind of a thing that people don't understand how much time and effort goes into just getting to know the patient and the story that brings them to us. I think it'll be nice to see more representation of that, not just surgeons, please. No, like in emergency medicine people. 
Mine is probably going to sound a little bit weird, but um, one thing that's been really hard through the pandemic is uh, people not understanding end of life measures or um, power of attorney, living will. I feel like Honestly, that should be something that you have to fill out every time you go to the DMV to renew your driver's license, because we've had so many situations where somebody is laying in a coma on a ventilator with no chance, like literally no chance of surviving or having any kind of quality of life. And the family is left with this devastating decision without, you know, all the extensive medical knowledge that we have to, you know, withdraw care, to make them comfortable or to keep going indefinitely until, and I'm sorry to be graphic, but until their body rots away. And those decisions and stuff are just so devastating. Those conversations need to happen. And, um, you know, a lot of times on TV, you know, they see CPR and things like that. And someone's awake on a nasal cannula five minutes later talking with their family. And that's simply just not reality most of the time. And um, so if there's any way to promote those kind of conversations in, in reality for people to start talking about it with their family members, I think that's super helpful. Thank you, Emily. Thank modeling, you. modeling behavior that we wanna see from leaders, yes. modeling behavior we wanna see from doctors to themselves, to each other, nurses to themselves, to each other. This cultural piece we need to see more of the modeling of what we are our aspirational goals here. If we can't, if we can't get gloom and doom because David's audience won't watch it anymore uh, because we're talking about COVID, let's turn it around and let's try to show them what what we can be and what we should aspire to be. Yes. And uh, and and I think that'll help a lot. And I just add one more thing. I just think we need to expand on what the healthcare worker team includes because a lot of it is doctors, nurses, but my physical therapists, my yeah. CNAs, my, there are so many of uh, my social workers, case managers. I think people really need to know what is included in this healthcare worker team that takes care of patients. Yeah. yeah. So David, they, they go to you for the residuals when all of these ideas end up in the episodes for season five. Is that correct? In your hearts, you'll have. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys, we, we have officially hit the marker on, on the time. Um, more than anything else, I just want to thank you guys for taking 90 minutes. I want to thank you guys for a great conversation. Um, and I want to thank you guys for what you do uh, across the board. Corey, Natalie, Emily, David, um, everything you guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis is so important. Uh, Corey, what you guys have done with the foundation that I've, has reached me at the White House and on the Hill, and I was aware of it. Um, Natalie, just from watching on the first wave and then realizing here that you are an absolute force to be reckoned with. Um, and Emily, you just, you're such a, a, your ability to put really kind of complex and difficult, particularly in these political times, uh, issues in a really cogent, clarifying manner. I am enormously appreciative. Um, and, uh, and I'm grateful that David now has all these really great ideas that he's going to turn into to wonderful television. But most of all, thank you guys so much. And I'm going to turn it back over to Kate. Thank you, Phil. Oh, my goodness. That was amazing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Phil, for managing this fierce panel with so much passion. I mean, they have this passion. You were managing their passion. And I know you have passion too. You're going to have four children soon. So, you know, uh, anyway, thank you all for coming. Those of you in the audience, uh, before you sign off, a survey is going to pop up. We'd love your opinions on tonight's discussion. Uh, if you don't get a chance to answer it tonight, don't forget. Uh, we'll email it to you tomorrow. So you'll have to do it eventually. Thank you again, Corey, Natalie, Emily, David, Phil. It, this was a fantastic discussion. Thank you for your hard work uh, in all of your professions, in storytelling and in life-saving and in advocating and in reporting what's going on at the White House. So thank you all. Have a good evening, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Hey, thanks.